What is up you guys? It's me, your girl, your Casey. Well, you look handsome today. How are y'all doing? I'm doing pretty banging. I read six months. I said that wrong. I read six books in the month of June. Two were pretty bad, two were meh, and two were pretty good. I got some two stars, three stars, and some four stars. Nothing quite a five star, nothing as god awful as a one star, but it's an okay reading month for the average, I'll take it. Let's me get some ranting energy going. Let's start off strong. The four stars. I read this month, finally. It has taken me forever to read The Secret History by Donna Tartt. Four stars. I hate the, the way this book looks, cause like, oh, ancient Greek bust? That's interesting, well bam! It's suddenly purple. These don't match at all. This was previously a DNF like a year ago, because I was on a ton of painkillers and I literally could not focus reading on it. Calm down. But now I am not on drugs, so I've given it my full attention. Four stars. So if you know me, you know that I love The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. This is one of her, is it her first book? It was written in the 90s, so it's actually pretty close to being 20 years old. And if you're character driven and you just want to follow some weirdo people around, this is the book for you. If you want an intense, fast-paced plot, no, don't read this. <laughs> Secret History is about our average, but you know, pretty smart, but listless. His name's Richard. He's our main character. He lives in California. He's just been like coasting through life. He's doing like a biology degree in order to become a doctor. He has no idea why he chose that. He hates his classes. He hates blood, bodies, being in the labs. He hates the idea of being a doctor, but he just chose this. And you know, he's having a quarter life crisis now. Actually more like a fifth life crisis. Like he's only like 20 years old. But he so happens upon a brochure to this quaint, picturesque cottage, cottage, college in like New England. And it just seems, mm, perfect. It has a classics program, a Greek program, because our boy Richard, he's pretty average, like I said. He's coasting, but he's very good at the Greek language. So he manages to get in there. He gets accepted, much to the shame and scorn of his family. They're like, you're going off to study Greek? Good luck getting a job with that. Very supportive, but, I was trying to be cool, but it's in this program, the Greek program, where our boy Richard, under the tutelage of this charming, charismatic, and immoral professor, he meets this group of five others, also studying Greek. We have the mysterious twins, the dark brooding Henry, the preppy trust fund kid Francis. He wears one of those fancy glasses things. And lastly, rounding off this five tet pentagon, I don't know, we have Bunny. Now that's a pretty important name in this book, because if you read the first sentence, the first sentence of the secret history, you know that Richard and these other students they kill Bunny for some reason. And so we're just meeting him in the beginning, so we know he's gonna die. So we just gotta like slowly cruise through this book, get to know the weirdo kids, because they're so intelligent. And everybody on campus is like, look at those Greek students. They're just so, wow, there's something about them. But they shady, man, they shady. Richard has fallen into this trap of idolizing them. And he does get accepted into their friend group. And it's very John Green this way, like slightly, smarter than average guy, gets into the quirky group, and goes on crazy shenanigan adventures. Except murder. We have to find out why we're gonna be killing Bunny. How we're gonna cover it up. Will we pay for our sins? Very interesting, very slow. It took to page 170 for the pieces, the, the gears to start actually moving in the plot. But because I just liked watching these bizarre people, because everybody in this book, even though it takes place in the 90s, talks like from the industrial revolution in England, like, oh, how you doing, my good man? All that junk. And they're 20. My parents were in their 20s in the 90s. They were wearing overalls, playing on the Atari, just nothing like how these characters act. So you can validly say that they're a bit larger than life and they're not something you can take serious, which I completely understand. But again, they were fascinating. And they do have like over the top personalities. And my opinion is I'd rather have you over the top than just completely flat. So my character driven sense was happy. One of the main plots of this book when the plot gets going or the main message is how easy it is to like take those little steps down until you suddenly realize you're like 300 feet down from where you previously was. Like how easy it is to go from just grayness 
to pitch black evil. And that's what their Greek professor kind of instills in them just by what he talks about during his classes. It's a good book on just examining human nature. And also with Donna Tartt, I just have to brag, just talk about the prose. She writes so beautifully without rambling. Like she packs in a ton. The reason it took me so long to read this book because it's tiny font with like very little dialogue, just pages and pages of inner monologuing and descriptions. And that's not my jam, but with Donna Tartt it is because it's just so good. It is a four star because it is very slow, but that's very minor with me. But unlike The Goldfinch, which I took a lot out of, and the relationships in that book were so good. The friendships were goals like up there with Luck, Lamora, and John. But this one, it just kind of starts, happens, and then ends, which if you think about it, it's very true with life. Like not every story has, you know, ups and downs. Some are just like a little hill, which makes it believable, but it's a book. I want to be entertained. Didn't really take anything out of it, but it was still a fun ride. The next four star read that I read was because Christy Lewis at Dobieski in Space, she had us read the Scorpio Races by Maggie Steve Otter. So I was on the discords and I showed them this shadow puppet I did of a crow while I was at Bible study. And I said, oh, I made this shadow crow for my friend to send it to her because she's reading Raven Boys and Christy Lewis. She's like, Raven Boys? That was written by Maggie Steve Otter. I love Maggie Steve Otter. Oh, have you read the Scorpio Races? One of my favorite books. It has cannibal horses. I was intrigued. So then a bunch of us decided to read the book together and it was a four stars. So what we got here in the Scorpio Races, there's this island. I don't remember what the island is called, but it's a very unique island because there's these water horses, like, you know, from Irish mythology. There's a movie about it, but they're horses, not like dinosaur things, but they're from the sea. So they're horse swimming, however a horse swims, and then they come up the land and, oh, look, beautiful horse from the sea. Oh, it's getting closer. I'm gonna pet it. Oh, then it bites your whole hand off because they're carnivores. So like once every year, I think the natives of the island, they like capture some horses and they get ready to have a big race every year. Our book has two main characters. We have Sean and we have Huck. That's her name. Sean is like Mr. Horse Expert. He lives and breathes for the horses. Like this is his passion. And he has a really good connection with the water horse that he got, that he plucked and tamed from the ocean. It was actually his dad's horse before him for his, but the dad had some complications with living. So now it's Sean's. He loves his horse, but it's not technically his horse. The horse belongs to the stable master who Sean works for. But because Sean is like the best horse guy, he's the only one who can ride the cool horse in the races every year. And it makes Mr. Stable Master money. So Sean's main goal is win money in the races so he can buy the cool horse from the mean Stable Master. Then we have Puck. Her parents, they too have complications with living. They are dead and worse off. One of her brothers is leaving, abandoning them. You know, he can't take the grief, although he is honestly the most selfish character in this book. Like, oh, I'm just gonna abandon my little sister and little brother on this island terrorized by cannibal horses because I can't deal with the memories. Blech. So yeah, Big Brother is abandoning Puck. Also, Big Brother has been keeping a secret. The house with mom and dad's passing, it's about to go to the evil stable master because the house isn't paid off. So Mr. Evil Stable Master is about to kick Puck and her little brother out of the house. So they're about to be homeless. Now Puck, she likes horses, but like regular horses. She has a regular horse, not a cannibal horse. So to get money, she decides to enter her regular fleshy, tasty, yummy horse into the race. I think she's, she's got a chance. So she goes and signs up her horse and Sean's just looking at her like, you're gonna die. And most of the book is just leading up to the race, the training, the like bond building. Well, my favorite thing about this book was the relationship between Sean and Puck was very natural. It was building up to a romance. Duh, it's young adult fiction. <laughs> but it felt really natural. My favorite thing is that even though they're technically rivals in this race because they both want the win to get money, they were never hateful to each other. They were like helping each other. And I'm like, wow, that's healthy. So that impressed me. The water horses were the best part. Lots of blood and limbs everywhere. But there also are a lot of characters in this book and they get jumbled around a lot. Like I can't tell any of them apart. One of them died gruesomely and I think I was supposed to cry, but I couldn't remember who the heck he was. So I didn't. There's this sudden like side character romance. I'm like, how was this built up? Do I care? No. Bring me back, Sean. 
I like Sean. And also the book is called, this is really what took it from a five to a four. It's called The Scorpio Races. So I was thinking like, if this book is this big, I thought like this much of the book would be the races. No, this much of the book is leading up to the races. Races only last like 15 pages towards the very end. Like, wow, all that build up just for like a sprint. I, I really wanted like miles long excursion across mountains and desert. I got a sprint across the beach. The race itself was entertaining, but it was too short. Overall, a very good introduction to Maggie Steve Otter, because I've always been interested in the Raven Boys, I just haven't picked it up yet, and I am impressed. Although with cannibal horses, it's hard for me not to be impressed. I enjoy diamonds. Next up, before I forget them, because they're Kindle books, so no physical copies, I read Rabbits. I tried to roll my R there. Rabbits. We go from Hannah Montana. Anyways, it's rabbits. So there was this podcast called Rabbits. Okay, pretty popular. I listened to it. If it was a book, I'd give it three out of five stars. It's about this game called Rabbits, where you're supposed to like go out in the world and like find discrepancies where things don't fit in. Some Mandela effect stuff. Some things called like impossible pictures. Like, hey, this picture from 2016. There's a homing pigeon in the background. Wait a second. Those went extinct years before 2016. It's an impossible picture. Following up things like that, seeing where those clues lead to, that gets you to the end of rabbits where you can win the game and if you win the game you can be recruited into the CIA you can get untold riches and glory but who exactly has won the past rounds or iterations of the games I don't know how to pronounce that word hopefully I'm right the past winners of the game because it starts randomly like it can, a new round can start up as soon as the old round ends or it could take years to start up again but the past winners are called the circle very secretive group no one really knows who the winners are just they know them by their usernames I guess kind of like ready player one how Wade is called Parzithal mm. so you don't have to listen to the podcast before you read this book but because I'm a completionist I did. Honestly, I prefer the podcast over the book. The podcast, the narration and the actors in that narration bit were pretty good. And it was spooky and interesting and it had like good quality to it. However, when they tried to do dialogue and emotion in their voices, they weren't good. Like I remember cringing at some of their lines. And because it's a podcast and they have to like keep their viewers interested in listening, I felt like they were just like throw out random events that seem like it has something to do with the plot in the game of rabbits. But when you finish the podcast, you're like, what? why did that happen? Same thing with the book. The dialogue, it's okay. Like it's not cringy, but it's not special either. Neither are the characters. Oh, by the way, I get this book too. Like, it's a very simple writing style, even though it's like a a big book talking about big concepts like multi-dimensions and stuff like that. The Mandela effect. It reads very simply so it's easy to understand and because I was reading this in a fantasy book at the same time I really appreciated the simplicity of it. But because it was told so simply I didn't get a good read on our main characters. Like they were there, they existed, but I can't tell you diddly squat about their personalities. The podcast of Rabbits talks about the ninth version of the game while the book is about the 11th version I believe. So some time has passed in between and our main character of the book is called Kay. Kay isn't really a player but they're an expert in rabbit. They're like the really loud fan in the bleachers who's never played football but knows everything about football. One way that Kay like keeps the interest in rabbits going and also makes some money is Kay just gives some lectures about rabbits. Like here's some evidence I found that this game actually exists, that it plays an important part in keeping our society working actually. Because part of the mystery of rabbits besides how to play it is why are we playing it? What, what makes it so important? And some people are like, oh, it's just a fun game. And others are like, no, it's literally keeping our society alive. Kay is definitely in that latter camp. But during one of these lectures, a millionaire walks in. Don't you love it when a millionaire just walks into your private lecture hall. Mr. Millionaire is Alan Scarpio. Now this is important because he's also in the podcast, but he's rumored to be one of the circle, one of the past winners of rabbits, but it's not actually confirmed because, you know, secret, secret, hush, hush. One of the rules of rabbits is you don't talk about rabbits. Play club. So when the lecture is over, Mr. Millionaire comes up to Kay and says, hey, I need you to fix the game. Like the newest round is about to start up, but there is something horribly wrong with the rabbits. Like it's broken. If you don't fix it or help me fix it, the whole world is screwed. So Kay kind of freaked out by this. It's like, whoa, oh, okay. Um, can we talk about this later? You, you can fill me in on some clues, but I don't really know where to start. 
So Mr. Millionaire is like, oh, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow. He doesn't. He goes missing. So Kata can't do anything. I don't know what to do, man. And then the world starts getting a little wonky and the game is truly broken. And it's up to Kay to fix it. As mentioned before, Kay, no personality besides video games. Eh. And as mentioned before, in comparison to the podcast, trying to keep viewers or readers interested, and it just throws random events into the book. Like one character in this book gets murdered, brutally, bloodily. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what villain did this? But then by the end of the book, it's never explained. Like, oh, that just happened because we needed him to give us a clue with his last dying breath. Deal with it. It has very lazy exposition. Like a whole bunch is revealed in like the last hundred pages, seven, fifty pages. Yeah. Like we suddenly have a villain towards the end of the book. Oh my gosh, where have you been this whole book? You literally popped up out of nowhere. What are your motivations? Oh my gosh. Thank you for telling me like this much for motivations. He has like the same motivations as that guy from Spider-Verse. One character, a side character that's very important to Kay, very important, is introduced in that last, well, <sighs> this person's name is mentioned throughout the book, but we don't really meet and get her deal until towards the end. And that's not enough time or mentions for me to build up or believe that there's a relationship between this person and Kay. But suddenly we're supposed to care for her and suddenly Kay is supposed to care for her. So lazy villain motives, exposition, character development. And also the ending just sort of fell really flat. And so much was un unanswered and that bothers me. I am certain Slender Man is in this book and it's never explained why Slender Man is in the book. I guess people can argue that part of the charm is that it's up to interpretation and open-ended on purpose and it's vague, vague to keep the mystery alive. But I want answers. Oh, I feel like I got something from this. I'm just like, Slender Man was in this book. I don't know. Not my favorite. Also like the first chapter of this book has dialogue ripped exactly word from word from the podcast into its narrative because it's a standalone. But we have to take the basics that we know from the podcast and put it in the book somehow. So new readers who haven't heard the podcast will know what the heck is going on. And as I'm reading, I'm like, this is exactly like the podcast. I mean, it has to be done. I'm not mad about that. I'm also like, could you make some new words, different sentence structures, different word orders, please? Do I recommend the book? No, especially if you haven't listened to the podcast. I would recommend listening to the podcast though. That one's three out of five. It's interesting. I just like the cover of this book. I'd get a tattoo of that. But the book is a two. My next Kindle read is Winds of Strife. This is written by a new author friend of mine. Cool chat. So sweet. Oh my gosh. Discord messages. We talk a lot. So funny. I like him. He likes Pikachu. We like Pikachu. You like Pikachu. Did you know Pikachu's a mouse? I didn't. I thought it was like a teddy bear rabbit thing. But no, I am not a Pokemon master. But this is a reread for me. I tried reading it a while ago, but I was like very close to a reading slump and I did not want to read anything. I've been reading a lot of fantasy like back to back and I was very burnt out on it. So I put it down for a bit and I picked it up. It's a three. It's got some good, it's got some bad, it's got some interesting things. Okay, let me lay the stage because we got a lot of world building here. We're in this world. We're on this continent. Do not ask me what the continent's name is. It's a kingdom. We're calling it the kingdom. Basically, in the kingdom, or basically in the whole entire world, the nights are getting longer. So the days are getting shorter. And you know, this is freaking people out. So Mr. King guy, he's like, I know who's making the nights longer. It's the females. Because in this world, we have sin spiriters. I hope that's right. I'm gonna call them witches and wizards, okay? What these witches and wizards do? Well, first off, being a witch, a female with these powers, illegal. You will be killed. Don't do it. The wizard people, they have this emotion-based magic which is something that really interests me. I think that's great. Oh, I would love to read more of that. Like they can harness calm, which puts like a shield around them. People can't hurt them, but they can't hurt others. Nice. They can harness anger, which is like fireballs. Nice. They can harness, I think, confidence, which makes them run really, really fast. Cool. But only the men are allowed to do this, like I mentioned. The women, they know good, they witches. And Mr. King, because he's fought some really powerful women witches in the past, and also because there's this gigantic flood that happened, so you know, most of the world is gone, what's left of the world people are fighting for, he's convinced, I think. I don't know if it's like a natural thing that happened or if a witch did cause it, but he's either like, 
oh my gosh, uh, a flood, a witch caused it, or he's like, that witch really did cause it. So he doesn't like women. So Mr. King Guy, he's out on this, you know, let's kill the women witches party. In 20 years in the past, we got this one witch, she's like raising a baby. It's her baby, I think. Or maybe she took it. I think it's her baby. This baby is Ivy. She's the chosen one. Yeah, there's a chosen one trope in this. She's perfect at everything. But Miss Mama Witch is protecting baby Ivy. But to protect her, she like channels the flames of hatred, which is like the anger flames, you know, fireballs. But the, the hatred flames are like a million times more deadly because they eat you alive to fuel the flames. It's like your last sacrifice kind of thing going on. So Mama Witch gives up her life to protect Ivy from like evil villagers who are like, oh my gosh, there's a witch in our village. Mr. King finds the baby like unharmed. He's like, I shall raise you as my own for some reason. He knows this girl's a witch. Girl's a witch. So girl plus powers equals evil in this world. He's like, I'ma raise you as my own. That's not smart villain guy. So 20 years later. Ivy's in the castle. She's a princess. Mr. Villain Guy still doing his villain king guy things. Then we have this other guy, our main character. His name is Nye. Nye is psycho. I like it, but also don't. So a long, long time ago, Nye, he had this girl. The girl was a witch, so illegal. And one of the king's wizard guys, Harbingers, that's what they're called. His name is Kirak. He's like the main leader of the Harbingers. He got word that, hey, there's a witch here. So he goes and hunts down the witch, who is Nye's girlfriend. He kills her. And I think he like sets Nye on fire, which isn't good for his health. Made his eyes all burnt and scorched. But Nye survived. And now he's like, you killed my girl. You burnt my eyes. I'm coming for you. So Nye has snuck into the Harbingers with his own powers. And now he's plotting to kill Kirak. He's plotting to kill the king. But because he went through a lot of pain and because Mr. Kirak when Nye was on fire, also tortured him by like summoning the emotional power of fear. Nye now has lost his sanity. He has a voice in the back of his head. His name is Madness and it's my favorite character. Madness is like, let's kill everyone. Let's kill everyone. And I love it. Best character, 10 out of 10. So Nye, he's on the revenge spree. He's like, I'ma kill you. I'ma kill you. But he's also like, I'm also interested in the suffering of our women folk. I am going to wed the princess Ivy, become the next king, revoke all the laws outlawing, you know, the murder of witches, and everything will be hunky-dory. Nye beats all his women friends. This book has a lot of contradictions. Mr. Villain Guy, I'm out to kill all the female witches because they're too powerful, adopts a super powerful female witch into his family. Like he knows. Nye, I am here to save the lives of all these women in the kingdom. He beats, because he has this collection of women with him, which is that it's his job as a harbinger to go out and, you know, kill the witches. But every now and then he like saves some of them in secret and they hide in his house, but he beats them. The book eventually gets to the point that it's out of grief because of what happened to his girlfriend. I didn't get that part. I'm all for dark and angsty characters, but this is a little too much because it doesn't make sense. So the book is chiefly about courting Ivy, stopping the darkness, planning assassinations, dealing with the madness lurking and gnawing at your brain. There's also this group of renegades led by a female witch who are going out and killing harbingers, justifiably if I must say so because their harbingers are trying to kill them. They got their sights on both Kirak and Nye. So there's a lot going on, but I do think character inconsistencies are the main thing. Like I said, villain guy adopts witch Nye for women beats women. Also, one bad villain at the very end who's very like, I hate this guy, I hate this guy, I hate this guy. At the end, he's like, please forgive me, guy. I've expressed nothing but hatred to throughout this whole book. And he says it while he's also beating, or at least trying to, because he's like killing him and asking for forgiveness at the same time. Like, I don't understand what's happening here. There's also a girl who's introduced into the book. And she was also my least favorite point of view, because there's a ton of point of view characters in this book. I think her name was Lylan. Lylan watched Nye kill her mom. Lylan does not resent Nye at all for this. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, are you simping for Nye? So that's one of the issues. Also, there is a ton of exposition in this book. Like I would say about 70% of the dialogue is talking about the magic system. And I'm all for deepening the magic system. But I also want to get to know the characters. Because when the characters started to banter and actually express personality, that was good. But most of the time, it just got sunk into, swallowed by 
the exposition. The last main issue is the relationship between Nye and Ivy. Nye, his plan is to marry Ivy. The king, the adopted dad of Ivy, he's like, yeah, I want you to take my place after I die. Because he doesn't know Nye is trying to kill him. He thinks Nye is on his side. So Mr. King, he's like, my daughter is super powerful. But the only way I've been able to control her these past 20 years is harnessing her love. Now, love is one of those emotional powers. Love is basically mind control emotional control. The king has basically been using his powers to keep Ivy in a daze. She's trapped by love for her adopted father. He's also using confusion magic on her because they've noticed Ivy has like this ability to learn like that and they're afraid of her power. So Mr. King is like, if you're gonna take over, you have to find her with love, you gotta keep her confused. Basically emotionally manipulate her. And I was like, okay. Now, I'm not for Nye. I mean, I like him because he's kind of the anti-hero and he has like a dark alter ego in him and that attracts my inner angst, my love for villains. But ain't gonna lie, seeing how these people treat this one woman, manipulating her and stuff like that, uh, it made me feel really uncomfortable, ain't gonna lie. And I I've read some intense thriller stuff. And also for all that we're talking about with the emotional magic and about love, because you'd think it describes it like, oh, the feeling of my love for him blossoms with a never dying fire in my heart, stuff like that. But instead of like talking about how he's using his powers against her, he just, the book's written like, oh, I just made her love me like that. Like no build up. It just kind of happened. Like all this exposition before, and then like when it's like the main character and his main love interest together, everything's like this. I wish I could describe it better, but when you see it, you see it. Things are too slow when they need to be faster. Things are very fast when they should be taken accordingly. In the end, it's a really interesting magic system and a world. And I know there's gonna be sequels. So hopefully there'll be like more talking when they're talking instead of exposition because we've laid out a ton of the groundwork already because I, I, I want to know what happens with Madness. I really like that character. He made me laugh a lot. But a lot of the character motivations just flop back and forth. I don't like Nye at all as a person, so I'm not excited to read about him, but he's the one where the madness the evil voice is in, so I have to like him, but I don't like him because I don't like how he treats women even though he's on this crusade for women. I don't know. It's a three. I'll, I'll check back with you later on with the sequels. Read as you will. Read at your peril. Oh, and I wanted to tell you this story about the secret history before I forget because I forgot to tell you when I was reviewing this book. I was watching an episode of Hoarders and this episode was about book hoarders. And so the hoarder crew, the ones who are here to like clean up the mess, they're like squeezing through these little hallways stacked with books like you have to crab your way through to move three feet so the moving crew is in but it's very packed it's hard to move and these are some big dudes so they bump a bookcase and the whole bookcase just like falls on top of them so like the host of the show she's talking to the couple who owns all these books and she's pretty mad she's like don't you see isn't this a good thing that these books fell on top of us instead of you? Because they're pretty elderly and they have health conditions. And so she shows them the bookcase that fell and it has like one leg shorter than the other. So they're using a book to like keep the whole shelf level. And she's like, this is the book that was holding all of this up. And it was The Secret History, a different cover from this. But I'm like, that's the book I'm reading right now. And I've seen a glimpse of my future and it scares me. Next up, let's get to my two stars. This is The Dollhouse. This could have been a very interesting thriller. Did I say Dollhouse? No, that was a play. I read that play, it's a pretty good play. Very controversial for its time, I remember. But this is The Doll Factory. There's no doll factory in this book. Okay, so we're in Victorian London, and so it's very dirty. It's very dirty. There's urine everywhere, man. But there's this girl, can't remember her name, but she works in like a doll shop. So I guess that's the doll factory, but it's not really a factory, it's a shop. And she's painting the dolls and everything. She really, really wants to be a painter. But for now, she's stuck making just dolls. And she's got a little deformity, like her collarbone is just twisted a bit so like her shoulders a bit higher than the other and meanwhile across the street there's this creepy guy creepy can't remember his name either but he's obsessed with like skeletons taxidermy preserving the dead he has like this collection of taxidermied mice that he like dresses up and everything he pays like street urchins to like bring him dead animals and stuff so he can stuff them and one day he happens to bump into our girl and he's like taken aback by that sexy collarbone 
And so he starts to get like this unhealthy obsession with her and it just builds and builds and then thriller stuff starts happening. And I'm like, ooh, okay. That sounds interesting. Dark stalker, love it. It wasn't executed well. This book is so slow because I just told you something that sounds like a thriller. Like, ooh, ooh, shady. No. For the majority of this book, we're just gonna talk about how our main female protagonist wishes to become the most renowned female author of her generation. We're gonna detail extravagant painting lessons and oh, this flourishing romance between her and her artist mentor. We're just gonna completely skip all the cool thriller stuff and just paint pictures and go on dates. I don't like that decision. And so our girl protagonist, she don't know Mr. Dude exists. Like she's seen him, maybe said hey a couple times, you know, passing on the street, but she don't know him. Nothing. She doesn't know his whole deal with her. She's just living her life. And Mr. Creeper guy is just watching her from afar, but look at her, she's amazing. Why does she keep ignoring me? Oh, I'm a locker in my dungeon. And so a bunch of this book is just really chill painting stuff and our hero and our villain never interact until like the very very end and because our hero doesn't know the villain it's like it's intense like oh my gosh the thriller stuff that eventually kicks in and happens to her and puts her in a bad situation with the creepy guy but she doesn't know who the heck this guy is so there's no real build up I guess like I like thrillers when the real like trust is portrayed and stuff like that. This book took forever to get to this part and our main character is like, I didn't know I was in a thriller, I was painting pictures. It's so much like a contemporary, then it's suddenly like, oh yeah, I'm a thriller. Let me just fix this real quick. The thriller bits happen in the end, then it ends in the most unsatisfying way. And I honestly just thought it was a bunch of wasted potential. Like, did we really have to, oh my gosh, I remember. So one of the street urchins in this book, like there's three character perspectives, the girl, the creepy guy, and the street urchin. The street urchin doesn't matter in the story like yeah he's part of like how these two people sort of got introduced but he's not really important so we had his point of view chapters fluttering the book if we would have taken him out entirely because we wouldn't have missed him he's not important then we would have had like maybe the chance to get our villain and hero closer to each other so like the big oh thriller betrayal at the end would actually like matter instead of just like appearing to be some like happen chance thing but that doesn't happen and it was just very very bland mm, don't recommend it all cool cover though but nah and my last book is a retelling of like 12 dancing princesses it's called a house of salt and sorrows so we got these girls 12 of them living in this house. It's a lighthouse by the sea, as lighthouses do. And you know, they just live in their merry life, but the sisters keep dying. First one, then the other, then the other, and soon people are like, wow, this family's cursed. That's no good. Well, let's stay away from them. We might get cursed too. So all these girls, they're like, all of our sisters keep dying. We can't get out of mourning. We have to wear black clothes all the time. None of the boys are talking to us. Life sucks. But one day they happen upon a portal of sorts that takes them to wonderful balls where no one knows them, where they're able to dance their hearts away. But when they chance upon this portal, the shady stuff happening in their house just tends to escalate more. And the danger becomes even more real. The first paragraph of this book really hooked me, which is funny because this book is like a two or a three. I can't remember what I rated it. I'm just so mad about it now. But I remember that first paragraph because it's the sister looking at her other sister and just admiring her necklace. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's such a beautiful necklace. But guess what? That necklace is on her sister and her sister is dead. And she's considering pillaging her corpse for the necklace. I'm like, wow, we're getting intense right off the bat. So the main mystery of this book is finding out why all these sisters are dying. Also, we have a sister who's our main character, obviously. I cannot remember her name because she left zero impression upon me, just like her romance did with one of the characters in this book. The romance was nothing, no chemistry, very insta-lovey, like they're all up on each other very quickly. Which is funny because illusions are a big part in this book and a lot of the illusions are wrapped up around him. So half of the time we do have these characters, you know, talking together. It's not real, so that's half the amount of chemistry. Not good when you're struggling for character development. Also, just like with rabbits, backstory is introduced like at the last 60 pages 
a villain is introduced last 60 pages and the villain was mentioned once before once and oh my gosh when he did show up it was creepy and something weird happened which i liked but i'm also like where have you been the whole book man it was a good villain i just wish he was actually present in the book i hate like a sudden villain reveal i love villain reveals but when it's just suddenly plucked out of midair like that no and it was slow we're just dancing in the house, no character development, no personalities, just waiting for the mystery to be solved. And when it is solved, it's like, okay, yeah, that happened. And while I was reading this book, it reminded me of why I love the book Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky so much. Because typical books, everything re is revealed at the end. And hopefully it's done right, like all wrapped up in a pretty boat and you're less satisfied. But with this book, no. Like, okay, you give me one hint in one sentence throughout the whole book and you expect me to gasp at the villain reveal. No. However, in Stephen Chbosky's book, Imaginary Friend, everything is revealed like in the middle of the book, but we still have like another 400 pages, which means we know exactly what the villain wants, who the villain is, what they can do, what the stakes are, and now we just gotta run for our lives, survive, deal with the crap, and it's like a whole nother book attached to it. That's what I want in a book. I don't want everything to be told at the very end because you feel like it has to be done because it's a book. You have to wrap up everything nicely. I want to know what the consequences after the revelation is because a lot of books skip over that. And thinking about this book, I don't remember how anything was resolved, but how? Yeah, basically this book was just like a blip in my memory. Not good. Not bad. It was very good like describing things. It has a briny taste in my mouth. Like I got a taste of the sea while reading it. But not good. I'd rather read Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky, one of my favorite books. Actually my second favorite book of all time. My first favorite book of all time is Elders by Christopher Payne. Let me go read it. And that is it for my wrap up everyone. I had the bad, the meh, and the hey, you're pretty good. I'm not gonna have a TBR this month because my TBR is gonna be like all over the place because of some videos I have planned. But I'm definitely reading Name of the Wind, which is right there because there's a Discord buddy read of it going on and I'm due for a reread of one of my favorite fantasy books anyways. But if you have any opinions on any of these books, tell me down below. Comments. I like comments. Please comment and like and subscribe. I appreciate it. I won't feed you the cannibal horses, I promise. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching and until next time, stay reading my friends.